Um, let me introduce Doug, Doug Taumi. He is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he's taught insect-related courses for 40 years. His most, most recent book is the book that we've been reading, uh, Nature's Best Hope, um, published by Timber Press, and it's a New York Times bestseller. He is also author of Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants, as well as other books, articles, and research papers. He speaks nationwide about the need for people to re-examine their yards, and he leads a grassroots movement to restore biodiversity to our cities, suburbs, and towns. So please help me welcome Doug Talmy. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. Okay, great, sorry about that. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and thanks for joining me tonight. Um, before I talk about my idea of what nature's best hope is, I wanna return to what happened in 2019, fall 2019. We had uh, what we call an oak mast. I think you had it in Ohio as well. Uh, all the members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those, those acorns and I just stared at it and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a hole for its head, forced its head through there. Then it forced its rest of its body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy finally plopped down. This is a very dangerous time for this insect lover because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface, takes about 30 seconds and down it goes. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa then stays for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think they have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts to a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in, and that's how the, the larva gets down there. We might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year like most insects? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. And if the weevils came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Once they're gone, that leaves a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum. And you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils. And if they find a new acorn with a hole in it, they get very excited uh, because their old acorn is falling apart. So they go and they tell everybody it is time to move and they grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they grab everybody and move into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else can come in. And that is where they will live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. I was giving this talk to my, my wife a, a while ago and she said, well, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? My point is that that's just one of, of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. Here's another one, the specialized relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. Um, the relationship between witch hazel and uh, winter moths. This is one of the winter moths, the bicolored sallow, turn out to be the major pollinators of witch hazels. The relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they feed their babies, a bunch of carpenter ants. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the large trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So for example, uh, in, in the Ohio area, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. So I could talk about, about nature's specialized relationships all night long. The problem is that, that these relationships today, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that we can't leave the country as it was, not now, because we haven't. 
It's only about 5% of the, the 48, lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it, we've drained it, we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cows. And of course we've, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our, our uh, skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants are too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on might wonder why we've done that. Uh, I imagine that we thought the earth, our nest, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? I'm talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one. North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Almost a third of our, our North American bird population gone. Now the UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they report this uh, as if it's just another headline. They might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. This is not an option, folks. It is not an option to lose the, the, the nature, the natural systems that support us. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that box. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Uh, well, E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus at this point, most famous entomologist of all times, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so radically change energy flow through our terrestrial uh, ecosystems that the, the food webs that support our animals, the, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our fr freshwater fish, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients. All we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news here, and that is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature, on, on what we call ecosystem services produced by healthy functioning ecosystems. Here are just a few of the things that, that plants do for us, but for everything else as well. We believe it or not, we're not the only things on this planet. They produce oxygen, pretty important. Uh, they clean water, also very important. Slow its journey to the sea where it's too, too uh, salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important ecosystem service today. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way. Taking the carbon from that molecule, building their own tissues from it, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground through their roots. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Uh, plants also uh, are building topsoil and holding it into place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. You know, if our plants disappear, we're going to have to eat sunlight without them. And that's going to be a challenge. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of those flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and other important things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services it's just not a good idea. It never was a good idea, but today it's a, it's a downright terrible idea because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet and taking huge areas out of, of the planet out of production um, is, is not thinking ahead very well. 
I have to say we're having a big thunderstorm right now. It is pounding rain. I've got to force myself to concentrate on all, all the Leopold. There have been visionaries through the ages who have, have recognized that we humans have got to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Lepo was one of the most eloquent, wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been pretty good at doing that for a while. But uh, our, our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the Earth than it has to offer in any one place completely ruining that place, then moving to another area, ruining that one, obviously not very sustainable. So Allah had a, had a dream that we humans were actually uh, capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew that we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he, he, he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called uh, a land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about was actually developing a land ethic where we lived. And I'm not sure why that, that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was, was so, uh, um, so much a part of the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still a part of our own culture, that he might not have recognized that it actually was an option. What I want to argue tonight, though, is that living with nature um, not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. Why is that? Well, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and we need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where are we going to do that? Well, let's return to, to private property. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% 80, of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. We're going to fail big time because we're not going to be working on enough of the land. But there are uh, a lot of places we could be doing conservation. We're right now, we're, we're, we're really not. We're not thinking about it. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? There's 21 million acres in those types of landscapes. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Then we have all the places we live both in rural areas and suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. If you add up just these, and you can think of other places, that's 599 million acres that could be used effectively for conservation, but right now is not being used that way. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's uh, bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, plus Montana, plus California and Texas. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. Uh, we can do conservation pretty much anywhere. Now, when I talk about doing conservation, I'm really talking about a, a form of restoration. We're trying to rebuild functioning ecosystems. No, it won't be exactly what was at that place before we dismantled it. Uh, but it can be close enough to be a functioning ecosystem. All we have to do is, is unite uh, those specialized interactions that comprise most of, of nature. And it will, it will turn around in a productive way. The point is, uh, not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most important ones, the building blocks, and then other species can join in later on. And there's two groups we cannot do without. One is those flowering plants and the pollinators that allow them to, to reproduce. Because uh, those are the plants that are capturing the energy from the sun and doing the, the bulk of the job in terms of turning that energy from uh, the sun through photosynthesis into food. And that's the food that, that um, you know, all the animals on the planet depend on. We're not gonna have those, those, uh, those flowering plants uh, unless we do have those pollinators. So that's a group that we, we absolutely need. Now we have the energy from the sun locked up in the, the leaves of these plants. We have to get that to animals or we're not going to have the animals, which means you're not going to have a food web. You're not going to have a functioning ecosystem. Most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate 
plants. That's something typically is insects. And it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So uh, in our restoration, we have to design landscapes that have a lot of caterpillars, or again, we will not have functioning food webs or functioning ecosystems. Let me give you an example with the Carolina chickadee. Um, just like all the chickadees across the country, they are, uh, during the winter time, they eat seeds, they're granivores. 50% of their diet is seeds, the other 50% is insects. But when they're reproducing, they, they don't feed their baby seeds because their babies can't eat seeds, they can't digest them. So they switch entirely to insects and spiders. And if they're in a healthy environment, they feed their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And they're not exceptions. 96% of our, our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects and most of those insects turn out to be caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that's the case, but this is a citizen science project that one of my students did recently, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call for bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds while they were bringing food to the nest during the breeding season. They were gonna send those pictures to Ashley. She was gonna identify uh, the prey items that are in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet of as many birds as she could across the country. And she got thousands of pictures and was able to rebuild the nestling diet for 20 of the common bird families in North America. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. That's the green bars you're seeing here. So again, imagine what would happen if we did not have enough caterpillars in our landscapes. Most of the terrestrial birds would not be able to successfully reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? Uh, well, actually several things special about caterpillars. One of them is uh, that they're soft. So think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The sausage is, is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's made of chitin, which is undigestible. So the birds don't want a lot of it. And because the caterpillar is soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your baby without fear of injuring it. And that's, if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. They take that beak and they just stuff it down there like a plunger. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you wanna chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. Much of a beetle is, is undigestible and be, a lot of beetles have uh, many sharp edges. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get them from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have lots of, of carrots to get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrot, she will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this prothonotary warbler male, who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And he takes those lutines and makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are they getting their carotenoids from? They're getting them from the, the prey that they eat, of course. But as you can see, carotenoid levels are not equal across various invertebrate prey items. These first two bars are uh, types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of insects. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves. Fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So uh, that study and, and several others suggest that caterpillars are probably not optional parts of bird diets. It's looking like they're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The question now is how many do they need? Is one a day enough, one or two a day? Well, let's go back to chickadees. We've got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. 
it takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of Carolina chickadees through to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they fledge, uh, they continue to, uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to count that. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because there's, that's pretty much all that's left in an awful lot of places, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. The chickadees are foraging about 50 meters from the nest and not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not have all of those caterpillars, um, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like that's one of the major causes of bird decline. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's a group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years and divided the terrestrial bird species up into the species that require insects at some point in their life history and the species that don't. So things like uh, finches and doves uh, can, can actually reproduce on seeds. They didn't lose any numbers in the last 50 years, but the species of birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. That's not, that doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as insects go, so go our, our birds. And, you know, this isn't rocket science. If you take away the bird food, the birds aren't going to do very well. So I'm concluding that we need to change our, uh, or at least add a goal to the what, you know, the way we, we landscape. In the past, we've thought decoration, the plants are just decorations and we're only gonna landscape uh, for aesthetics. Okay, we can still landscape for aesthetics, but now we have to add function in there. We've gotta have uh, functional ecosystems at home, ones that produce the insects that support the food webs that everything else depends on. So how do we add caterpillars to landscapes? We add caterpillars by adding the plants that support them. And that seems pretty easy, except there is a catch. And that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we choose. And we have to be fussy about which ones we choose because the caterpillars themselves are very fussy, like the monarch butterfly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all of the, the burning bush and all the boxwood and all the calorie pear and all the other Asian ornamentals that we decorate with in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly because the only thing they're gonna, gonna develop on is milkweed. That's called host plant specialization. And monarchs are not unique. Most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants have forced them to specialize. Plants don't wanna be eaten. So they, they load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They're simply too well protected. Um, and if you don't believe me, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. There's a reason it, it uh, is hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. This is not a joke though. Insects do eat plants. How do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Uh, well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And a, an insect species can adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two. Uh, plant lineages, and they get good at getting around the defenses in those particular plants. They develop the enzymes uh, that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And once they do fall into place, the insects locked into eating that particular group of plants because they didn't spend any time developing adaptations for other plants. And that's why when we bring plants in from, from other countries, most of our insects can't eat them because those plants have not been here nearly long enough for any of our insects to adapt to them. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. When we're trying to rebuild food webs, we have to choose the plants that are gonna allow us to do that or it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do pay attention to which plants we put in our yard. I'm gonna start with, with um, our yard right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. 
uh, they, they broke up a farm uh, a while ago into 10 acre lots. We bought one of them. It was a very old farm. It had been farmed for, for about 300 years. The soil was totally exhausted. And the last thing they did was to mow it for hay. And when you mow for hay around here, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants from Asia. Multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and autumn olive and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and miscanthus and porcelain berry and on and on. You mow that and then you call it hay. And, you know, it's okay because they're giving it to the mushroom industry. Well, of course, when we built the house, they stopped mowing. And what do you think came back? None of those rootstocks were dead. So all of those invasive plants came back. And that's what the entire 10 acres looked like, just a giant tangle of, of Asian plants. That's my wife, Sydney. She's getting ready to clear the 10 acres and she has done it. Um, so if you have an invasive uh, species problem, don't, don't give up. Um, it is a lot of work, but fortunately she enjoyed doing it. And uh, you know, just telling you this because you can be successful. You can, can win this battle. Uh, what was I doing while Cindy was, was working hard? I was telling her she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back. Remember, the goal here is to restore this, this, this overworked piece of property, put the biodiversity back on it. And we're not going to do that unless we put the caterpillar populations back there that support the birds and everything else. So one of the things I wanted to see if I could, could bring to the property was a Canadian owlet. Never even seen a Canadian owl. That's what one looks like. That's what the adult looks like. But you're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have their host plant, meadow roe. It's the only thing they eat. We didn't have any meadow row. Uh, so I got some meadow row seeds from some places, planted them. They grew very nicely. Um, this was early on. And I actually had very little confidence that any Canadian outlets that I'd never seen anywhere would find my little patch of meadow row. So I didn't even go out and, and check it for about two months after, after I planted them. One day I was walking, walking by for another reason and it, it, the plants were loaded with Canadian outlets. They had found them right away. Um, so now I've got a good population of Metaru and Canadian owls. So I've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That is a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's actually a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. Now I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds there, planted them. They grew very nicely. It took about a year for the uh, moth to find my, my Biden's patch, but it did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. Same story with a hackberry emperor. That's a butterfly that, that ought to be where we live. Um, so I wanted it there because, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it's the species that, that used to be here. And remember, we're trying to put them all back. But like its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. Um, Took about four years for the butterflies to actually find my, my hackberry, but uh, they have, they're doing very well. Walked by one of my hackberry my trees uh, last June and on a single branch, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars. So there we go, we've added six species and that's, that's how it's gone. Uh, I didn't plant goldenrod, came in on its own. Along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is the goldenrod flower moth. Um, it hasn't come yet. I don't know why it hasn't found my, my goldenrod. Uh, that's what its caterpillars look like. But this is, this is actually part of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. One of these years, I'm going to go out and look at my goldenrod, and I will find this moth, and that'll be a great day. Plant a Virginia creeper. I don't know why people don't like Virginia creeper. It's, a, it's an excellent native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down, has good fall color, makes great berries for the birds in the fall, uh, great little teeny flowers for the uh, pollinators in the spring. They're not showy flowers, but the pollinators sure love them. And it's a major host plant for many of our large sphinx moths that are uh, one of the primary components of cardinal nestling diets. So things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia Creeper. I want to see if I can get the double tooth prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Who wouldn't want the double tooth prominent? Well, it's a specialist on elm. Uh, we didn't have any elm, but at the University of Delaware, a few of the big American elm trees never died. Never got around to dying when we brought in the Dutch elm disease. So the, in, right about now, the gutters are, are loaded with um, elm seeds. So I got some seeds uh, and, and planted them at home. It's been 19 years since I planted those, those seeds, but no way, American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. 
I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted evening primrose and the moth came with its head, spends the day with its head stuck in the flowers. It's very key our property. I wanna spend some time on oaks though because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or food webs that run the ecosystem on your property. Uh, this is what our house looks like now or it will in a week or so when the leaves are completely out. Um, I'm sitting in this window right now. Look, we've got lawn, we're very traditional here, but we put a lot of plants back. And I, I learned early on that every time we added a new plant lineage, there was a good chance that the moths that eat that plant would come as well. So four years ago, I made it a, a goal to try to take a picture of every moth species uh, on that I could find on our property. I'm still at it, but uh, I'm up to 1,045 species of, of moss. Got another new one last night. And we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, uh, we have 40% of all the moths that occur in Pennsylvania. And because many of these are, are types of bird foods, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. So I'm telling you this because we keep seeing headlines like this. This is the, the uh, World Wildlife Fund this fall said that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not at our house. I am, I am certain that we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds, probably more than that. And it didn't take that long. And we did it simply by putting the right plants back. So this works. So, you know, these are, these are scary headlines, but we can turn it around. I don't know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres and a lot of people don't. Will it work on smaller plots in suburbia? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, they live in a typical development. Everybody's got the big, big lawns. They have 0.6 acres. So that's 18 times less property than Cindy and I have. Uh, and, but they did, they did the right thing. Their, their yard was, was loaded with uh, Amara honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle highly invasive plant. They got rid of that, put in a lot of native plants uh, and also a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their 0.6 acres. And they're up to 149 bird species that have used their, their yard, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that, that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. How about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house uh, in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right on the other side of that wall there is uh, one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one-tenth of an acre. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre, but it's three times smaller than the average lot, lot size in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area at all. No connectivity. She's a little teeny island. Uh, well, she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count the birds that use her yard. She tells me she does it with a, a glass of wine at the end of the day. That's a nice way to do it. But she's up to 118 species of, of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's, there's Pam's woodcock. Maybe he's there for the wine. I don't know. But What about city centers, though? 82% of us live in cities now. Are they all gonna be left out of this fund? Well, in 2014, I was, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed, which reminds me, we got a, we got a marketing issue with our, our uh, native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it a monarch's delight. Okay, I was staring at Monarch's Delight 2014, and the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees, two species of megachylid bees, a big one and a small one. Uh, I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their, their pollen on their tummy, not on their, their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, leaves uh, like those on, on redbud. Those are perfect. The bees cut out the edges of those leaves, snip them out and make these little semicircles, then roll up the, the little semicircle into a tube and then stuff it full of pollen, lay an egg on it. And, and then they put that whole package into a crack or a crevice and that's how they reproduce. Well, there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. So those leaf cutter bees had everything they needed and that's why they were there. It's probably why there were bumblebees there as well. Now remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. So uh, 
in the springtime when they come out, there are no workers to help them. They've got to start the colony all by themselves. So right now, any bumblebee you see is a queen you know, desperately trying to find enough food to start her colony. And if there's a uh, red bud around that, you know, just copious amounts of pollen and nectar, uh, it, it really allows them to get off on the right foot. Probably why there were bumblebees there. Then I saw a monarch, I saw two monarchs actually on Monarch's Delight. Now this was 2014. I'd gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point in the Eastern uh, population of monarchs. Only 3.6% of the, the monarchs left compared to 1976. Uh, and this was June. It was early in the season for us to see monarchs this far north on the, on the East Coast. So I was, I was encouraged. Maybe the monarchs aren't going to disappear after all. Why were they there? Well, they had, they had monarchs to light, but there was another milkweed there as well. I think it's purple milkweed in bloom. So they had, they had nectar, but they also had their host plant, everything they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. The High Line is an is a elevated railroad that was uh, abandoned for decades. Somebody went up there and, and saw a whole bunch of native plants that seeded in and, and were growing on their own. And they said, well, let's make this a, a tourist destination. So they sunk a lot of money into it. And, and now it's a very successful tourist destination. Literally millions of people go to the High Line to enjoy this little strip of nature every year. And it is little, it's about three feet wide and then it runs the length of the High Line. This is Rick Dark. And by the way, you know, we're 30 feet above the taxis here. I mean, this is, this is not much habitat. Uh, Rick Dark, he was always after me to go see the pretty plants on the High Line. And I'm not much of a city boy, so I always drag my feet. But, um, you know, seeing pretty plants and having nothing using them is actually depressing to me. And that's what I was, I was certain was gonna, I was gonna find in the middle of Manhattan. But I was totally wrong. I saw everything I just described to you within the first 20 minutes. Somebody's just finished a survey of the bees using the High Line. They're up to 30 species. Um, so, you know, I'm convinced. If thoughtful native planters can bring uh, life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do this anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. Uh, and one of them is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn because we've got too much lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn. And that statistic came out in 2005. This is 15 years later. I don't think we've lost any lawn. Uh, and lawn, of course, is, is a, uh, you know, it's an ecological deadscape. That is an area bigger than all of New England, by the way. So it's a status symbol and we're not gonna get rid of it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting we do get rid of it, but I am suggesting we reduce the area. We, we cut that area in half. If we replanted half the area that's now in lawn, that would give us 20 million acres to, to uh, essentially build a new, new park. And if we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park, and it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? You get, you get the opportunity to uh, develop for the first time or redevelop a personal relationship with the natural world. And you can do it at your own time, your own pace. All you have to do is go outside. You can avoid crowds. And if you go to a real national park, millions of people there. No admission free fee, it's, it is free. And it's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience that natural world alone. And I don't know how you can develop a personal relationship with the natural world unless you are alone. You're interacting with the natural world. And this is especially important for our poor kids who, you know, Richard Liu says they're all suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying, we, you know, we get 30 kids and put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area. And the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And then they get back on the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really, let's face it, it's experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world right in their yard, then go home go outside and experience, experience it alone, develop that relationship. No parental supervision, they've got to work it out on, on their own, which is so important because that's how they're going to learn to love it which they have to do because they're the future stewards of that natural world. 
And if they don't, you know, if they don't have that personal relationship where it means something to them, they're going to be lousy stewards. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of, of uh, the natural world. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. So she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt uh, lizards in Hawaii. First, you get on the ground and then you disguise yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly towards toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress, but you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, then you take care of it. You learn how to, to be a good steward of the natural world. You've got that personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She just sent me this picture, so maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life, and I'm sure that will go a long way to making her a good steward of the planet when she grows up. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get this book by Nancy Stranisti, uh, Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, and, and get yourself on the map. You're going to join the growing number of people who have joined Homegrown National Park, which, by the way, is, is free. All you're doing is, is putting your data in. Um, and your data is where you live and the amount of area that you're going to plant in, in natives or already have planted in, in natives. Um, so you're right here in Ohio, and you will see the other people in your, in your county who have done it. Um, it's our attempt at social media to try to, try to build some enthusiasm for, for saving the world. How about that? Um, got about 7,000 people on the map at this point. We're trying to get that 20 million acres converted. Um, we've got a little ways to go. We've, we've converted about 1% of it so far. So, so help us out. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that was once lawn? Well, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Now, remember the, the Roman arch? Um, that's a Roman arch. The stone in the middle is uh, called the keystone. And if you take the keystone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, I'm calling them keystone plants because if you take these plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our, our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. So think of the keystone plants in your yard as if they are the two by fours in the ecological house that you are building. They're essential for your house to stand up. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. They're not the only thing your ecological house is built out of, but uh, they're a necessary thing. So don't, the question is no longer simply are natives better than, than non-natives in terms of supporting the life around us. On average, they certainly are. Uh, but there are actually a lot of natives that don't contribute all that much to local food webs. So let's focus on, on those keystone plants that, that do, the ones that are really driving the life that is out there. Uh, they're certainly better than benign plants that aren't doing much and much better than those ecologically destructive ornamentals we have brought in that become invasive species. The, the Bradford pears or the calorie pears, the burning bushes, the, the bar berries, um, the porcelain berries. I mean, you know, we can go on and on and on that are now escaped into our natural areas, biologically polluting them, ecologically castrating them. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know the ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because um, that's, not, that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're productive or not, whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care whether ginkgos grew in the moon or not 7 million years ago. Uh, they produce zero caterpillars in our landscapes today, and that's what, what counts. So they're there, they're occupying space, but, you know, they're not supporting the local food web. What is the best plant is one of one of our oaks. 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states. That's 557 species of bird food in the mid-Atlantic states and over 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that uh, in terms of, of productivity. 
So just to give you an example, here's the, the role of keystone oaks in, in my yard. And so far I've, I've photographed 1,045 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, but I will. Out of the 1,045 uh, species, 919 have known host plants. Out of the, so there's more than 100, we don't know what they're eating. Out of the 919, 275 species use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of, of native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is, is Quercus, the oaks. And we've, we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting at least 30% of our moss species diversity. That's the role of a keystone plant in, in, uh, in anybody's landscape. So how do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to National Wildlife Federation website. Put in uh, your zip code, go to Na Native Plant Finder in the National Wildlife Federation website and put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, both woody and herbaceous plants uh, for your county will pop up. They're ranked in terms of the number of caterpillars that they support. So this is what a typical list will look like. And it, you know, I stopped because I ran out of room. The lists are bigger than this. Native oaks, native cherries, native willows. I'm saying native because if I go to the to the nursery and I say I want to buy a cherry, they'll sell me a, a you know an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I want to buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, it'll be a European birch or a maple, probably be a, a Japanese maple. You've got to specify that you want a native member of these these genera because there are non-native members. And if you get the non-native members, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. These are the top herbaceous genera uh, in, in our areas. Goldenrods are always way up there. The various genera, the asters are split up into uh, the sun, sunflowers, helianthus, particularly the perennial ones. Um, so not only are these the three best in terms of supporting caterpillars, goldenrods, for example, support 110 species of caterpillars, but they're also the best in terms of supporting the specialist bees, the ones that can only reproduce on particular pollens. Those three genera alone will, will support uh, at least 40 species of bees in your yard. If you have them, that won't be there if you don't have them because that's the only pollen they can reproduce on. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects into our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. Uh, there's a lot of research coming out, particularly from Europe these days, that is, is very convincing that light pollution, those lights we have on at night, are one of the major causes of insect declines. These are all the ways that lights uh, kill insects. And you know this is actually good news to me. We have to turn this insect decline around. Uh, we, we, we just can't, I mean, it's, it's not an option to tolerate it. We're not gonna be here if we lose our insects. So we've got to start to build those insect populations up. And if we can do it simply by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. I mean, what, what could be easier than that? But I know what you're gonna say. I can't turn that light off over my garage because if I do, the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. Or if you don't wanna do that, take the white light out of it and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is uh, the best. Yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to nocturnal insects. So if we switched out our white bulbs with, with yellow bulbs overnight, we would save billions of, of insects um, and, and billions of dollars too, because LEDs are much more energy efficient. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights. Then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill all of our insects. There's no, we have no shortage of ways to kill our, our insects at home. This is a booming business around the country. Mosquito Joe is single-handedly undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. And he'll say, well, this is okay because it's a natural product. And it is a natural product. It's a pyrethroid. It comes from chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product too. So. That's not a good argument. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes and that's not even close to true. Um, kills all the insects it comes in contact with. The big thing is it doesn't work. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes. Mosquito Joe kills about 10%. So he's not even close to, to being effective, which is why he has to keep coming back and back and back, which is why you're paying him a lot of money for something that doesn't work. 
This is how you control mosquitoes at home. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in some straw or hay and let it, let it ferment for a couple of days. It's building up the diatom uh, uh, populations and algae populations. That's what mosquito larvae develop on. Female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs find that irresistible. So they will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you get a mosquito dunk from the hardware store and put in one of these discs after the eggs hatch, the larvae eat it. And this is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. So it'll kill your mosquito larvae and nothing else. If a dragonfly gets in there, it won't hurt it. If, a, if your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, it won't hurt it a bit. So it's, it's very effective, cheap, and it doesn't kill anything else. Fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillars eat the leaves, they spin a cocoon and hang from the, the branch, then they emerge as an adult, and then they do it all, all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Uh, they complete their growth on the tree, and then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way beneath the soil excuse me, pupate underground, uh, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. This is the way we landscape everywhere. We, we all know this. Um, the, you know, there's no leaf litter and it's mowed and compacted to the point where the ground is so hard that the caterpillars can't get underground. This becomes an ecological trap. We're calling in the adult moths to lay their eggs. The caterpillars develop and drop down and die. And I am convinced that this is a, another major cause of insect declines in all of our human dominated landscapes. And the cement landscape, of course, is even less of a viable option for those poor caterpillars. This is what most people do. They put a tree in, in their, their yard and then nobody's measured how well they, the caterpillars do in a situation like this, but um, I guarantee they do better in a situation like this. We have a tree and then a layered landscape, maybe a, a dogwood here and then a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down into a safe site. The soil is not compacted. They can easily get beneath the soil. They can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's growing, that's under here. Um, it's not gonna be mowed. It's not gonna be trampled. Survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening another safe site. But what you've really done here is reduce the area that's in lawn. You've turned it from a totally unproductive landscape into a productive one, and it is still beautiful. And it's a safe site. This is where you can use your, your ground covers, things like wild ginger or foam flower or, or may apple um, or a combination of, of uh, many of those safe sites. Ferns, another great ground cover. This is in Athens, Georgia. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are, are uh, red maples and any caterpillar developing on, on these trees can fall down into this fern bed, complete its development uh, and emerge as, as an adult, even though this is the middle of a city. So we can, do, we can do much better than we're doing right now. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And from her, her work, um, it suggests that there actually is room for compromise in our plant choice. What she, her, the question she asked was, um, can landscapes that are dominated by native plants sustain chickadee populations better than landscapes dominated by introduced plants, the, typically the Asian ornamentals that we landscape so heavily with? Uh, and the first thing she did was, was measure the caterpillars in these landscapes. And when they're dominated by introduced plants, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by, by 75%. Those landscapes are 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Even though there's a, a nest box up in each landscape, um, the chickadees came and they looked around and said, there's, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, uh, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. If you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass, woody plant biomass in your yard. We measured woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants from, from no non-natives to 100%. This is what you get. 
the dotted line is replacement rate. Uh, that's the rate at which the population, if they, if they, that's really that they're making babies that replace the same number of adults that die every year. If you, if you reproduce at this area here, you have a sustainable, pop, sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, anything below this line here, you have a shrinking population, unsustainable. Right here is where those lines overlap generously, and it suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. Can't be, can't be invasive. It can't be calorie pear or, or, or burning bush or the other things that escape. Uh, but you can have your ginkgo, you can have your boxwood, you can have your crepe myrtle. They're not moving anywhere as long as they don't dominate the landscape. And th this is the area I'm excited about because if my message was you can't have a single non-native plant in your property, nobody would be listening. We love our non-native plants. But remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So let's increase the percentage of these. We can tolerate some of these. Can native plants be used in formal landscapes? Of course they can. This, and there's nothing more formal than this landscape. I got this the other day uh, from Lynn O'Shaughnessy. Uh, this is taken from a drone. That's a that's a big garden, folks. And every single plant in that garden is a, a native plant. Um, so, you know, our uh, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. And, and I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a, a typical suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, let's just put, a, you just put a little fence around it. All of a sudden it becomes tolerable. It's actually beautiful. It's servicing a lot of, of native bees. It's not very big, you can make it bigger. Um, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. Remember why we need to help pollinators. I, you know, the argument I hear all the time drives me crazy. We need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually about a 12th of our crops. Uh, but people think, well, I don't live next to a farm so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? Drew Latham design. Uh, it's much bigger than, than the, the other one. Uh, imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are, are doing it. I'm sure you've heard of Minnesota's cost sharing program, encouraging uh, homeowners to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's called the, the Lawn to Legume program that, that help you pay for it. Pennsylvania, I just learned about this a couple of weeks ago. They've got a, a young lawn conversion program. It's only two years old, but you can get up to $5,000 per acre taking your lawn out and putting in uh, productive native plants. Uh, Florida, there's an island off of Florida that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls to, to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls are listed species. And this is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. Everybody would want an endangered species on their, their property because you get paid to take care of it rather than fined if you use your property. Missouri and, and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a uh, bounty on calorie pairs. You take out the calorie pairs, you get a, a free, re, uh, free tree replacement. And even water utilities are, are getting into the act. San Antonio Water System is giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient native plants instead of those thirsty non-natives. And of course the, the lawn conversion programs in, in California, very effective $2 per square foot rebate for taking out your thirsty lawn and putting in xeric plantings. I think we made three missteps in the early year of, of conservation. And one of the most serious is that we, we do not see nature as being essential. We like it, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, but if it's not essential, then when push comes to shove, uh, other things that are, are considered essential always take precedence and nature loses. The, you know, Congress has designated the budget for the national park system as non-essential. So that tells you what, what they think of it. As a matter of fact, the entire budget of the, the national park system is equal to uh, one B1 bomber. It's just not very big either. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo 
before the virus broke out and there was this wall size poster there. It says, uh, save wildlife for future, future generations. Um, and this epitomizes, I think, our society's view of conservation. Uh, we see it as a form of entertainment. It, it, was, it was Teddy Roosevelt's reasoning for making the national park system. We want to save these wonderful places so the future generations can uh, enjoy them. And it truly is uh, a form of entertainment, but it's much more important than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations, not just so that we can entertain them. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now, we talked about this. If we restrict conservation just to places where we don't have a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those places are too small and too disconnected from each other. David Quammen has an excellent uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I hate that. I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, even, even including our, our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again by putting the plants back, particularly those keystone plants. We're not just building biological carters that connect viable habitat with each other. We're going to rebuild viable habitat where it doesn't exist at all right now, where we live, where we work, where we play. In other words, we're going to start to share our spaces with nature for the first time. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a, a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of, of Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said the, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people, I, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We are great at teaching this one here, but we've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers what their obligations to earth stewardship is, are. It doesn't mean that you have to save uh, biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. If so many people feel powerless today, the earth's problems are so huge, what can a single person do? Well, in this case, the, the cliche uh, works. A single person can make a difference. A single person can shrink their lawn, can take out their invasive plants, can put in keystone plants and can build a, a pollinator garden. They don't have to do it all in one day, but they can do it and they can, they, a single person can revitalize their, their local ecosystem by doing that makes you an important cog in the future wheel of, of conservation. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about your little piece of the planet. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you're going to start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They'll love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we, we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are, are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Um, I want to go ahead and start with some questions. I know we. Um, are ending about 8.30, but um, we had a couple questions that came through uh, the email, email, and one is about invasive species. And um, you showed that picture of your wife. It just seems overwhelming to a lot of people. You know, how, how did she do it? What, what do you re recommend for people just trying to get rid of invasive species in their yard? Well, she did it uh, without any pesticides. She, she won't use them. Um, she cut them back repeatedly, uh, which is the hardest way to do it. It is by far the hardest way to do it. What, what I do uh, when I help out is to, particularly for the woodies, I cut them off at the base and, and paint the stump with an herbicide. They're using very little material. You've got to kill the rootstocks. If you don't do that, then it grows back and you got to cut it off again and again. Eventually you can, you can um, 
you know, exhaust the energy of those roots, but it takes an awful lot of work to do that. One of these days I want to take a soil sample right next to one of those stumps that I painted maybe a month or two months after I do it and see if there's anything in there. And then I'll be able to give people some, some real data. I've been saying that for years, I haven't done it, but um, I view herbicides as it's like chemotherapy. Um, you know, you, if you don't do anything, the cancer gets you. Not treating our invasives is uh, is a mistake, I really think. But uh, it's you know, it's there's there is a there's a trade off. So that's how she did it. A lot of work. Is there a way to um, introduce native species of animals like praying mantis, butterflies, ladybugs into the gardens, or you just plant plant it and they will come? Yeah, planet, planet and the right species will come. When you buy uh, uh, ladybugs, for example, they're, they're collected at the top of a mountain in another part of the country. And the first thing you do when you release them is they, they don't know that they've flown across the country. They'll, they'll fly 20 miles like they would have done normally. They, they're usually collected when they're estivating, spending the hot tar part of the summer. Um, the, there are still enough predators, natural enemies around that if we rebuild habitat, they will, they will come. So yeah, I wouldn't buy any of those things. Um, let's see. Um, there are a lot of questions about, you know, you know, my specific yard, what should I plant in the, you know, on the west side of the house or where it's, it's kind of um, draining. Let me recommend, let me recommend this book here. This is Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for Eastern US. And yes, that includes Ohio. And in the beginning, there are exhaustive, charts telling you which plants to use under particular conditions. Um, there's a lot of plants or books out there about native plants, but this is the best one in terms of telling you how to use them. Uh, it's by Tony Dove and Ginger Woolworth. So um, it will answer all those specific questions in, in my view. Great, thanks. Um, and are there any model wildlife corridors in any part of the country or you know, uh, in, you in, there's a lot of people in New England, particularly Connecticut, building, they call them pollinator pathways, where they're trying to, to establish these, these corridors. Um, so yes, they're developing. Uh, I'm sure we could, you know, find, pull up a map and, and find areas where there's a lot of people participating. Okay, great. Um, what ways do you suggest that we engage local nurseries, politicians, landscaping companies, big box stores? <laughs> you know, okay. how, how do we the different get approach other to each involved? one of those? But well, you know, that's one of the goals of, of Homegrown National Park is to get people to realize we have an issue that they can contribute and make a difference. The nursery industry is is waking up because they realize there's a big market there. We got 129 million homes in the U.S. If everybody relandscapes, that's that's a business opportunity, and people are recognizing that. Uh, politicians do whatever their constituents tell them to do. They just want to get reelected again. So when you have an elected official, you say, "This is important to me. This is important to everybody I know." That's how you get that change. And this is where these these municipalities that are changing the rules. This is where it's coming from. Delaware just passed a ban on, on selling invasive plants. And you know what's special about that? There are other, other states that have passed bans, but in this case, it was a unanimous vote from both sides of the aisle. You can think of anything else where you get an unanimous vote from both sides of the aisle. So, so more and more people are realizing that, you know, these are, these are important issues. That's how we make the change. It's gonna come from us. This is. This biodiversity crisis is a global crisis, but it has a grassroots solution. It's you and me that is going to solve this. And I love that it feels empowering. It feels like something it is, that, it is, yeah. that I can do, that, that you can do, that people can do. Right. You know, I saw in the chat, somebody said, this seems so complicated. I want a, uh, a new industry to appear. We'll call it ecological landscaping or ecological gardening. So you can just hire somebody. Most people don't garden at all. They hire a, la a lawn service or they hire a tree service because they're busy with the kids or, you know, they I want people to be able to just, you know, pick up the phone and hire somebody who knows all this stuff so that you don't have to worry about which plants or where to get them or how to maintain them. Right now, if you, if you hire a typical landscaper, they'll do it the way they did it in the 1950s and, and, uh, you know, that's not the future. So we got to train those people. 
Um, what do you do with all the grass and sod that you're removing? Well, you don't, if you remove sod, you're removing um, soil and you don't want to do that. It's better to have it die in place. And you know, the easiest way to kill your grass is uh, put a bunch of leaves on it and it will smother it over, over time. That's the way you return uh, um, uh, organic matter to the soil. Then you can plant right, right through it. A lot of people wonder, what do we do with all these leaves when they fall in the fall? You, you put them where you're going to make new flower beds and just keep piling them there and it will, it will smother that grass. And then you can you put in your shrubs and other, all those ground covers right, right through it. So you don't, you don't have to, you, digging up your grass is, is losing a lot of very valuable topsoil. So you probably don't want to do that. Um, let's see, if you don't have space to plant an oak, is, what is the next best thing? Well, I bet you do have space to plant an oak because there are small oaks and most people don't realize that. I would look in Ohio, I would look for something called the dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. Uh, and you, it makes acorns when it's five feet tall. So, so you can get a small oak, but other good species, uh, Native willows are very good, native prunus. So things like, uh, you know, black cherry is excellent. A lot of people don't like that, but it's excellent. Pin cherry is much smaller. Um, American plum, that's a native prunus. Now that gets, that gets it, it, it's stoloniferous. So it, it kind of makes a thicket. So um, you'd have to give it space for that, but it never gets very, very tall. Those are all native prunus. Birches are, are very, very good. Um, why is it so difficult to find the keystone plants to buy? Someone says specifically willow trees, but. Well, it's really not if you look in the right places. Um, every state has a native plant society and they all have very good references about where these plants are sold. So I would contact your native plant society and say, I live here, where can I get these plants? They will help you out. I think we do have a link to um, the Ohio Native Plant um, Group on our website. So, um, and I'll, I'll be sending out some links afterwards. So um, look for those. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, someone's saying that they are clearing out non-native um, plants. Uh, holly bushes, boxwoods, um, pachyasandra, and people, other people want them. The question <laughs> is, would you give them away or should I destroy them? Oh, that's a good question. I've never gotten that before. Uh, you know, um, the ecological answer is destroy them. The nice guy answer, I don't know, you know, would, if you, if somebody said, do you have any smallpox spores? Can I buy them from you? Would you give it to them? I mean, this is an ethical question. You can ponder it, but when you give them away, they're not, they're not helping the local environment. So um, the, one of the hardest concepts for all of us is to realize that what we do on our property impacts everything else. It impacts your local ecosystem. It either degrades it or enhances it. Um, if it's an invasive species, it impacts, you know, a big area. And we're not used to that. We think, well, we have the right to do whatever we want on our property. So getting rid of our bad stuff and, and giving them to someplace else, it's, that's, I'm, I'm changing my mind. I'm going to say, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a question about the book title. I just want to, um, the, the book that we were reading is Nature's Best Hope. And right. um, Doug, you, you shared the title of the native plant book. What was that book title Essential again? Essential Trees and Shrubs of Eastern U.S. by Tony okay. Dove and Ginger Woolridge. Shrubs of Eastern U.S. by Tony Dove. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll send that out um, in an email afterwards too. Um, question, what is in the bucket of water to attract female mosquitoes? Straw or hay. It, just a handful. Uh, let's Should see. be mostly water is what's in there. Um, a question about talking to our neighbors and friends about, about this. Suggestions mm -hmm. for that. Well, um, you know, it's why I write these books so I can lay out the argument so that people can read about it and 
um, understand that there's logic behind it. There's reasons that we're suggesting this. It is very hard to walk up to your neighbor and say, you know, you're not living right. I want you to live the way I live. That's a tough sell. Um, so one way to convince people is actually make your yard a model that they would actually want to uh, copy. Um, that works if you do it well. Uh, but, you know, proselytizing to your, your neighbor is, th that's the hardest person to, to convince, I guess. Um, you can just say, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it without saying you need to do it too. And maybe, maybe they'll want to, you know, read a chapter or something in the book, but it's, um, we're changing culture. I mean, you, you look at our society today. How many, how many people's minds can you change on any subject? It's, it is hard because we adults get pretty in, entrenched. So the best way is to have them change their own mind and to see the, the uh, you know, the wisdom in it. You can use hooks. So if, if your neighbor um, loves birds, that's a great hook because you can say, you know, this, this is what birds really need. They probably don't love caterpillars. So you, that might not be a good hook, but um, birds is a good one. We've got 70 million people in this country that, that like to feed the birds. And if they, and people are alarmed when they see these headlines, you know, the, the UN says we're going to lose a million species. They're, they're upset about that. They're upset about insect decline, believe it or not. I didn't think anybody would care, but they do care. So, um, you know, maybe it'd be easier to convince people. You say, well, what they don't know is that they can do something to help. And if you point out this, this, is, this will help that, then it might be an easier sell than you think. What about like a certification sign? Does the Homegrown National Park have a, you, something you, you can put in your yard? Yes, it does actually. It's a, it's a template you can, you know, you print it out, make your own sign. We, we don't sell it, we don't sell anything, but. Um, you know, it's two people. It's really one person because all I do is this. But so it's Michelle Alfandari. It's her. It's her brainchild, and she's vastly overwhelmed right now. If anybody wants to write a million dollar check for Michelle, she'd really like that okay. <laughs> because she needs to hire people. Okay, good to know. Um, question about: um, I noticed that the birds at my home begin to build their nests before the plants leaf out. How do they know? those trees and shrubs will eventually produce the leaves that will attract the caterpillars to eat. Some, How do they know they're them, in the right tree? Yeah, some of them do that. Like doves do that very early. M most birds actually don't build a nest until things get going. But how do they know? How do they know anywhere? How do, how do they know? How can they fly from, from uh, Costa Rica up to your backyard, the same bird, and know it's your backyard again after a year? You got me. <laughs> they're smart little guys. <laughs> Um, what do you think of mason bees? I love them. We, again, 4,000 species of native bees, and they did almost all the pollination in North America before we brought the honeybee over. Mason bees is, you know, it's one species of that 4,000. So we've got a lot of bees out there. They're all important. And 70% uh, of them nest in the ground and 30% nest in, in uh, they hollow out pithy stems or, or very weak wood like elderberry. Great. So they are good. They're good. <laughs> good for yes. your yard. Okay. They're good. Um, a question about create, creating a native garden in the shade. Are there lots of species that will thrive in the shade? Um, yes. There are fewer species that bloom well in the shade. But again, that's where that essential trees and shrub, the, you know, shade plants are, everybody's always asking for those. Many of the ground covers, all of our spring ephemerals, all those things that like the blood root and the, you know, Jack in the pulpit and all these things that come up in the spring um, do well in the shade because they bloom before the leaves are out. So it's not shady. It's sunny in the spring, the trilliums and all of those, those things. Uh, somebody mentioned, you mentioned Pachysandra. There's a native Pachysandra. It's a nice ground cover. Um, does really well in the shade. There is a, uh, our native hydrangea, hydrangea arborescens, the straight species, not Annabelle. Uh, that's a shrub and it does bloom in the shade. I mean, it's, it's, it, it blooms in heavy shade. I don't know how it does it, but, but it does do it. Um, and it's a good, very good pollinator plant when you get the stray species. If you get Annabelle, they've, they've full with the flower, that cultivar has made the flower sterile and then it's not good for the pollinators, but Annabelle is the cultivar that, that will, they'll try to sell you that. So just ask for the stray species. So they're out there, the plants that do well in the shade, but um, most any plant will bloom better 
in the sun. Um, and a related question, if I plant more trees, won't that crowd out my flowering plants? There's a trade-off uh, between the shade the trees throw and, and the sun that you would need for flowering plants. So um, depends on the size of your property. Every property, unless it's a big property, can't do everything. So it's better to look at, um, rather than saying, okay, my property is the local ecosystem. It's really your entire neighborhood. And if, if somebody down the street, this is a, a chance to actually meet your neighbors and interact. You can divide up the ecological jobs. If somebody's got a nice grove of oaks down the street, you don't need another oak in your yard. Maybe you can focus on the pollinators because you've got full sun, something like that. But, uh, you know, all of these bees that are foraging, they have a much bigger range than just your, your yard. So think of the surrounding landscape and try to work with your neighbors to, to produce and, and then end up with, with uh, all of the different little microhabitats that you need. Great, um, let's see. Oh, someone um, sharing that there is a Facebook group called Landscaping with Native Plants in Ohio. So um, Great. check, I didn't know check about that, that out. Yeah. Um, here's a question. In, in Kentucky, we have a lot of gentlemen farms with perfectly trimmed fence rows. Have you seen areas that promote grown fence rows that encourage rabbits, birds, bugs, et, et cetera? Um, you know, Kentucky's horse country. And um, <clears throat> the one thing they won't tolerate is, is those prunus, things like black cherry growing up in a hedge because uh, who knows how true it is, but they say that the, the, occasionally they get tent caterpillars and the tent caterpillars crawl across the, the lawn and then the horses eat them, they say. And that makes the horse sick. So they're very strict about what grows around there and how much of it is, is real, I don't know but it's one of the reasons that things are very, very managed in horse country as to make sure that the, the racehorses don't eat anything they shouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. It's just an explanation, but can you make a hedgerow that's all native and, and productive? Uh, sure you can. I mean, I, you know, people think of hedges as it's always gotta be a monoculture, but it doesn't, it can be a dozen different species. A, a hedge is really, it's, it's a screen, you know, you're, you're blocking the view. And you can do that with a bunch of different plants all working together. Okay, great. Um, uh, here's an, another comment. People like the idea of not mowing grass. My neighbor wants to build an adjoining native garden, some on each of our yards. So um, here's a question, just a, if you would comment on lawn services. Lawn services are a business that I would like to convert to ecological landscapers. They sell you a lot of products you don't need. They, you know, we, our lawns are cool season European grasses. They want to go dormant during the hot summer, but we water them and we fertilize them at a time of the year to make sure they don't go dormant so that they stay green. We have to mow them and put a lot of energy in, into our, our lawn mowers and a lot of chemicals that then run off and pollute our, our, our aquatic, you know, our watersheds, um, all of the fertilizers are mostly, you got to read carefully, but most of the fertilizers that you buy for lawn also have herbicides in them. So it kills your clover and your dandelion and anything else that might be growing there. All the things we used to tolerate in the fifties, but now you've now, so when you put that stuff on your yard, um, that's why they put the little sign in there, you know, or, or, Orkin's just been here or whatever, whoever just treated your yard. And the sign says, don't walk across this yard. Even if you put fertilizer on your yard with, with your lawn spreader, the bag says, don't take your shoes off before you go in the house. And you know how long you're supposed to do that? After you apply this stuff, you're supposed to do that the rest of the season. That's how long this stuff lasts. But we do it, we take your shoes off the first day and then the kids are out rolling around it the next day and your cat's running in and then the, your cat gets cancer and dies and you wonder why. And so what do I think of lawn service? The, the, the lawn as a status symbol um, has gotten way out of hand. It used to be a, a sign of wealth because only the aristocracy could, could have lawn. Um, and, and so the, you know, we've marketed in a way that if you don't have a perfect lawn, you're, you're just a bad person, but it's terribly destructive ecologically. It's still a signal that we're following the rules. That's why I say we should reduce the lawn rather than get rid of it. It's a great place. It's a perfect plant to walk on without killing it. So reduce it to the areas where you're actually going to walk. 
Thomas Rainer says, lawn should be an area rug, not a wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Then you're using less, you know, fewer materials. You could probably hire a lawn service and dictate what it is you want them to, to do. But, but spraying by the calendar when you don't need it, they just want to charge you. That's why they're doing that. So, um, A question, uh, what is a good substitute for daylilies? You mean something that will look just like day, day, day lilies? Um, we, we have native irises. Uh, we have, um, we do have native lilies. Uh, I'm trying to think of the big tall one. Uh, somebody, help me out, somebody in the chat there. And at the end of a talk, I have a lot of senior moments. I can't even remember sure, my name. Sure, yeah. But, uh, there are substitutes for date lilies. Let's let's put it that way. <laughs> and maybe the book that you were showing us. Well, that's might... woody plants. The book oh, is okay, woody okay. plants. So no, it won't. But um, does anybody know Jim McCormick? He's in Ohio. He mm -hmm. gives you great great talks about how to do this. Okay. Bring him bring him in for a talk. He's retired mm -hmm. now. He'll be happy to do it. <laughs> okay, we'll look him up. Um, let's see. A question about the cost. Um, I'm trying to yeah, put in Turks, as many Turks natives. Cap, Turks cap lily. I just saw. Ah, it. okay, okay. No canna lily. I think that's not native. Yeah. Um. So, question about the cost of, you know, switching your yard over. Well, you know, uh, before the COVID, I went all over the country giving talks, and I'd hear people say, "I'm going to rip out all my lawn." That's a great way to get the cost way up there. <laughs> you can do this as a hobby. You can do it slowly. You can go out and collect your own acorns. That's why I mentioned that you plant an acorn, it's free. If you plant a 15 foot oak tree, it's $3,000. So there are ways to do it uh, a lot cheaper. And actually the smaller the plant you put in the ground, the healthier it will be because it gets to build its root system with the minimal amount of trauma. If you put in a big tree, you've got to root prune it and, and it'll spend a decade trying to rebuild those, those roots. That's the expensive way to do it. But a lot of people want instant gratification. They want to they think your yard is static and they're going to build this picture perfect postcard of a yard and it's going to always stay that way. No landscape is static. It changes all the time. So plant small and it will grow up and you'll get to appreciate that, that dynamic change. Um, but pick at it. Do what you, what you can. The more labor you do yourself, the cheaper it, it will be. We've got 10 acres and we've, we have bought no plants to put on our 10 acres. And now I've got a, I'm actually... Um, you know, we heat with wood in the in the winter time, and I'm heating entirely with the trees that have grown up since we've been here. Um, some of which I planted, but a lot of them, the blue jays planted or the squirrels planted, and I've got you know I'm losing my sun, so it's that trade up. I don't want to lose sun everywhere, so we're heating with the wood that's grown up here. Didn't didn't pay for any of it, so um, it doesn't have to be expensive. Okay, great. Um, I want to read this comment and question from Doug Horvath from Five Rivers Metro Parks, who's been partnering with us. Hey, Doug. Um, he says, I love this concept of a backyard national park. Doug McKenzie Moore talks about community-based social marketing, trying to help people make positive changes. What can be done to help this concept take off? You're doing a lot of presentations. Are there tricks from the marketing world that can be adopted to make, you know, just to I guess, promote the idea and... Um, well, you know, one thing I don't do is, is social media. Now, Michelle, who set up the, uh, the Homegrown National Park website, uh, she does have an Instagram account. But that's how people communicate these days, is through Facebook and Instagram and, and, and Twitter. And that can be very effective when, when done properly. I don't, I don't do any of that. I don't even have a chance to finish my email. But... Um, that's one thing that can be done. I want to comment uh, when you read it, it's, you said Doug was talking about backyard national park. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Everybody says about backyard habitat and yeah. it's, it's my pet peeve because it suggests that what I'm talking about is so ugly. We have to hide it in the backyard and it also cuts our available landmass in half. You can't touch the front yard. That's gotta be a dead zone. Who made that up? You can put that oak tree in the front yard and it'll be a, a living landscape. So um, so there you go. I can rant and rave too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, 
Should I let the dandelions and red clover grow in my lawn or pick them out? Well, there are a lot of generalist uh, pollinators, including a honeybee, that, that use them all the time. So if you want your lawn to do anything ecologically, you should leave them there. Um, the, the, you can have a nice green lawn by cutting it frequently, and it keeps those things uh, low. But um, if you actually do want to help generalist pollinators, you know, honeybees are in trouble too. They need we don't have enough forage out there. It's the major problem. You are helping them with clover and dandelions. Um, native Rs versus straight natives. Are the native Rs as good for pollinators? Uh, it depends on the, the genetic change that created the, the you know, native R is a cultivar of a, of a straight species. So if you're talking about uh, flowers, you're talking about the flowers of a, a uh, native plant, Annie White at the University of Vermont looked at that. Um, you can get her as a, a speaker. Those 4,000 species of, of native bees, the ones that had those specialized uh, interactions, they adapted to the specifics of particular flowers, the amount of nectar, the quality of the pollen, the shape of the flowers, the infrared signal that we can't even see on the flower petals. When you start changing all those things genetically, it tends to mess up that relationship and those things don't do as well. It's not a given. There are, uh, there are uh, examples of, of um, natural variants that have been found like, uh, uh, I think it's Phlox paniculata jenna was uh, uh, found in, in Georgia. It kind of evolved on its own, but it's got twice the number of flowers. And so it has twice the number of pollinators. And so that's an example of a cultivar that's actually doing better than the straight species. So it depends on what the change actually was. We did a study, not looking at flowers, but at other traits, like whether when you make a tall plant short, what does that do? And the only trait that consistently messed up insects was taking green leaves and making them red or purple because you're loading those leaves with anthocyanins that are, that are feeding deterrents. So the red leaf cultivars, the red leaf red bud and the red leaf penstemon and all those red leaf things that everybody buy, I would avoid those because that's going counter to what you're trying to do. The one thing I don't like about cultivars uh, consistently don't like is that they're propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variability. And, you know, that's the major challenge that climate change is throwing at us. It's the extreme climate variability that's going to take a lot of adaptation on the part of our plants. And you don't have adaptations without genetic variability. So um, that's a problem I have with that. If you want to buy straight species and you go to your, your nursery and they don't have it, ask for it. And if he says, well, you know, I'm not going to get it, then say, okay, and leave. If you buy something else and always buy just what they're selling, they'll never change. But if they realize there's a market that they're missing, they will get the straight species. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, it is 837. I know we weren't able to answer all the questions, but a lot of people have, um, as I think I mentioned before, you know, specific questions about their yard and about you know, the plants in their yard. And, and um, we do have the, the local organizations um, that I mentioned before, Marianist Environmental um, Education Center that is having a, an online uh, native plant gardening workshop in May. It's a three-part series. Um, I'll be sending that out in an email, um, but I encourage you to um, check in with them and uh, the Dayton Area Wild Ones, um, uh, someone mentioned the Facebook group about landscaping with native plants. Um, I know there's an Ohio group. Um, we've got lots of links to those um, groups on our website. So hopefully people will be able to connect with um, local experts that can help them with their individual problems. Very good. Um, and Doug, I just wanna thank you so much for just kind of your tireless work uh, sharing and educating I, so I get tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the, the opportunity. I, I, uh, I always enjoy it.